Keen on engines, so am I. Most people don't care very much so long as they have a comfortable journey. But to me, the most interesting thing is the power which draws the train along. And the story of how that power was first harnessed in the service of mankind. The story starts many years ago. Britain was beginning to lay the foundation of her industrial greatness. But at that time, the main sources of power were windmills and water wheels. But a new source of power was needed, more reliable and more constant. This need was to be met by steam, a power that was to revolutionize the whole world. The first steam pump to be widely used was that designed by a Cornishman, Newcomen. His engine was called an atmospheric engine because, unlike the steam engines we know today, which depend on the pressure of expanding steam, his engine used the pressure of the atmosphere. The principle was a simple one. Steam supplied from a nearby boiler filled the cylinder. A jet of cold water injected into the cylinder condensed the steam and the pressure of the atmosphere forced the piston down. The steam valve was opened again and the cycle repeated. This engine worked quite well and was used in many mines for upwards of 60 years. But although the use of the Newcomen engine was fairly extensive, it had several shortcomings. The chief was its extravagance. The cylinder had to be made hot and then cooled to condense the steam each time the piston moved through one stroke. This meant that a large amount of the fuel used went in heating up the cylinder after each successive cooling and the engine needed so much coal that it became too expensive to run. One day, James Watt, a scientific instrument maker of Glasgow, was asked to repair a model of Newcomen's engine. He very soon realized the failing of the engine and devised a means of remedying the defect and making the engine work more economically. His aim was to avoid the alternate heating and cooling of the cylinder and to achieve this, he arranged a separate container where the steam could be condensed without having to cool the cylinder. This container, or condenser, was kept permanently cold by immersion in cold water. When the piston reached the top of its stroke, a valve was opened which allowed the steam to escape into the condenser, where it was cooled and condensed into water, while the cylinder remained hot all the time. This arrangement disposed of the chief source of waste and effected a tremendous saving of fuel. By now, Britain was rapidly becoming an industrial country. Transport was needed to bring raw materials to the factories and finished goods to the town. Many people began to consider the use of steam for this purpose. In most of these early machines, the inventor tried merely to put a watt engine on wheels. But gradually, there evolved a smaller, more compact engine, like George Stevenson's rocket. The rocket had a boiler, a cylinder, and a piston, just like Watt's engine, but the principle was different. Instead of the pressure of the atmosphere, this engine was driven by the force of expanding steam. Steam at a pressure six times that of the atmosphere. At last, man had discovered the secret of the power of steam, and in the years that followed, the railway spread all over the face of Britain. <laughs> Newer and better locomotives made their appearance. But for all the 
refinement of the modern locomotive, it works in very much the same manner as the original rocket. Passing through the boiler from the firebox can be seen the tubes through which flow the hot gases from the fire. These tubes have steam pipes running through them, so heating the steam and increasing the pressure before the steam enters the cylinder. When the pressure of steam in the boiler is sufficiently high, the throttle valve is opened and the steam rushes along this pipe through the superheater tubes and down the feed pipe to the cylinder. Here, the pressure of steam forces the piston back and the movement of the piston is communicated to the driving wheels of the locomotive through the piston rod, connecting rod and crank. The steam is now diverted to the other end of the cylinder and the pressure returns the piston to the beginning of its stroke. This is what happens, but in practice it's a little more complicated. Above the cylinder is a valve sliding to and fro over two openings or ports in the side of the cylinder. This valve automatically diverts the steam first to one, then the other end of the cylinder and is controlled by the valve gear a system of levers connected to the piston rod and operated by the to and fro movement of the piston. This pipe feeds steam into the steam chest. These are the exhaust pipes through which the used steam escapes. The steam from the boiler is fed into the steam chest and as the valve moves to and fro, the steam is allowed to pass into one or the other of the ports leading to the cylinder. In this position, the steam rushes into this end of the cylinder, forcing the piston back. The valve now moves to the other end of its stroke. Steam is diverted to this end of the cylinder and the piston is driven in the opposite direction. Meanwhile, the used steam is pushed out through the exhaust ports and so the cycle is repeated again and again so long as the pressure of steam is maintained. Well, that's the story. I'd better be getting my train now. Goodbye.